Uh, welcome to Hey Hedgehogs. My name is Kelly Neely and I am the Educational Engagement Coordinator at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. As some of you might know, uh, the Whirl of Jambret exhibition is hanging right now in our largest gallery. So you can stop in when you have a chance to get a closer look at over 70 of Jan Brett's original illustrations right out of some of your favorite Jan Brett books. Today, of course, we are going to focus on one of Jan Brett's favorite animals, the hedgehog. We know Jan likes to give these cute little guys great little personalities, but today we are going to be finding out what they are really like in real life. And we're gonna get a chance to hear from um, a hedgehog expert, Vicki McLean, the Chief Organize Organizational Officer at the Hedgehog Welfare Society. While you're listening and learning, think about questions you might have for our hedgehog expert. If you have questions, use the chat button down at the bottom there. And um, although I might be out of view during the presentation, you can still ask your questions and I'll be trying to just kind of field your questions and um, let Vicki know if you have any that we should be sharing and talking about. At the end of the presentation, Vicki will do her best to answer any additional questions you have uh, throughout the presentation. As we wait for some other attendees to arrive, feel free to begin asking questions right now in that chat area or announce where you're from. If you feel inspired after the presentation, uh, go to wcmfa.org slash fallfest, or you know, I'll actually put it in the chat so you don't forget that. But if you go to wcmfa.org, uh, you can find uh, some great Jan Brett activities to follow along with. And Jan Brett actually has a video there where you can learn how to draw a hedgy yourself. Um, so I hope you enjoy the program. And in a moment in that chat bar, you'll see the link that you can go to. And when we're all done, I hope you get a chance to follow along with Hedgy and enter our contest, our drawing contest. And if you miss any of this presentation, you'll be able to find that there as well. If you stop by the museum today, you can get your very own entry form. Although you don't have to use an entry form for the contest. If you have just plain paper, that's fine. Uh, we will also have little baggies here that have some scratch art in them. So you could do your, your hedgy drawing on scratch art and some toothpicks in here to scratch with and actually a pencil as well. So stop by anytime today to see the actual exhibition in person. And see all those great illustrations and all those wonderful details up close. Um, you'll see some of your favorite hedgy books, especially like um, pictures from um, Hedgy Blast Stuff and the Snowy Nap as well. So I hope that you enjoy this presentation and in a few moments here we're going to hear from Vicki. I think you'll really be excited about some of the things she shows us and tells us. I learned a lot just talking from, to Vicki all about Hedgehog. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Vicki now. Vicki, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to get a screen up here. There, oops, almost. Thank you. There we are, I think. Isn't it your end? Yes, looks okay. great. Um, it, good morning, everybody. And um, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I uh, love hedgehogs and it, they're one of my passions. Um, and, and as um, Kelly mentioned, we're, uh, the museum is honoring Jan Brett today and maybe for longer i'm not sure but one of the neat things about her books is every single one of them with a couple of exceptions if you look hard you'll find a hedgehog um, sometimes they're a cookie sometimes they're behind a gnome um, and it's fun to try to find them her hedgehogs are uh, a, a particular type of hedgehog that we'll talk about in, in later now here is my friend Angus, and he's a captive African hedgehog. He's the most beautiful hedgehog in the world. All you have to do is ask him, he'll tell you. Um, exotic animals, and these are exotics because they don't come from here in the United States, um, have special needs. And, and so anytime you look at an animal that isn't in the pet, usually in the pet trade here, you have to take a close look before you go out and get one. 
because the reason we're here is because people get them many times without research and, and they're not cats and dogs. Um, but if, if they're the animal for you, they have lots of sweet and silly behaviors and, and making them um, very beloved to a lot of people. Now we're going to talk here a bit about hedgehog natural history. This is wizard. Um, one of the things that we're, we'll talk about first is where they live and where they don't live. They don't live in that shoe. He's there, but they don't. They have been here in alive as, as a species for uh, a lot longer than people. Um, the oldest found one the last time I saw some information was 56 million years ago, which is quite a while ago. Uh, and I'm going to look at this map here just briefly. Um, it's the whole world. And over here is Europe and over here is the US. Um, what you'll notice here is I have four colors. And actually I have information that maybe this, this group of hedgehogs over here has been turned into another, another group. But um, each one of these is a type of, of hedgehog. And this is the, is, this is the UK. And this is where many of the hedgehogs that appears to me that Jan Brett has gotten her idea about hedgehogs, although she probably has a ca captive hedge, uh, African, but I don't know that. Um, and over here, you'll notice is the United States. Now this little map here has a little bit of color on it. It shouldn't. And some same thing is true here, but uh, there's a reason for that. This is Russia wrapped around. But what you'll notice here in the United States where we all live is there's not a single hedgehog in the wild. Um, Jan Brett's appear to come from this area here and there are no walls here. Hedgehogs don't build walls so they kind of run into each other. Um, the ones that are here in the United States are in this blue area. They're uh, African hedgehogs. So we'll take a look briefly at each of those. This is a European hedgehog. And what I think is, is Jan Brett's. And this is Mama. And she has two little babies. Generally, they have somewhere between one and five. Occasionally, like people, they have yet more. Looks to me like she has two. And she's decided to take the kids someplace different. Maybe they're on a field trip. I don't know. But um, she can only have one in her mouth. This is a desert hedgehog. It was the pink color. Um, and desert hedgehogs are tinier. And the reason they're tinier is because over time they went from those northern countries down into the southern countries where, where the blue is. So from the purple to the blue. And as they did, there's less food. They, they, and it's hot. And so with, that, with less food over time, they became a smaller animal. The other thing that happened was that they were uh, the, the European ones, the ones that are up north, hibernate. And what that means is come fall, about now, they're really fat and they sleep like bears until spring. And that's important. We'll talk about that a little bit later with the European rescues because being able to hibernate is critical to the survival of the European hedgehogs. These little guys don't have to. What they do is go into torpor and um, that's three or four days when, it, when the temperatures drop. Uh, in the desert. Now they do have some things, all of them in common. They're not related to porcupines and they're not related to rats. They're actually in their very own group. They all eat meat and actually they're omnivorous. I had one little guy who would go after a chocolate chip and he tried to drag a chocolate chip cookie up my arm, which actually didn't work very well, but partly because the direction his quills go. But um, their teeth are shallow, they um, have belly fur and spines, and the spines are different than the porcupine spines. They don't come out, they're very short, they're, they're to protect them from other animals rather than porcupines which throw their quills. This is a long-eared hedgehog, and he's from um, a little further down uh, in, in the Middle East with a, a little bit darker color on the map that we saw. And uh, there are a few of these in the US pet trade. Um, I know that because I've seen them. And also a friend of mine uh, was working in Afghanistan and uh, one of these little guys fell in love with the hiding place in her hoodie. And he came back in her hoodie 
and oh my was he was he a terror he he uh he could knock books off shelves he he was he was fun but he pushed balls around he's a little bit more active uh at least in general than some of the um ones that are generally in the pet trade oh um they hate baths by the way um this is an african hedgehog in captivity and the reason i put one that's in captivity rather than one that's in africa is because i couldn't find a really good photo um of them over there but and they've changed some because breeders try to make them prettier or sweeter or you know a number of things and so um this little guy is mercutio and he was kind of a terror himself and he was mine he is gone they live uh depending upon their own genetics and who has them anywhere from three to five years i had one that lived six and a half years which was kind of exciting actually to have a hedgehog live that long now here's what some captive hedgehogs lives are like um and and they aren't all they aren't all hams this one likes to dress up she likes to dress up in her teapot she likes to dress up like she's going to see the queen of england and uh in fact i have a friend who had a hedgehog that that loved to dress up so much that when she was in a competition with other hedgehogs she noticed they all had costumes on and she ran down the line and ripped off everybody's or at least tried to rip off everybody else's costume because after all she was special and she really kind of was special she was an interesting girl this little hedgehog down here his name is kenny belonged to a friend of mine and he's what's called albino they have no pigment to speak of and so their eyes are pink their ears are pink their their quills are white some of those do exist in the wild but they're so much whiter than the other hedgehogs that they they tend to get eaten by somebody or another and so but but breeders like to breed them because they're so uh, popular among people here in the united states and that of course can breed in some special problems for animals um, as you get a small pool now these captive hedgehogs there were originally we think brought into the united states about 90 to 95 thousand hedgehogs from South Africa, so the southern part of Africa, and uh, then they stopped importation. And I'm not sure exactly why that was. Um, however, it could be because hedgehogs in Europe uh, are the only animals like that are not like dogs and, I mean, not like horses and cattle with those hooves that can harbor hoof and mouth disease. They don't get it, but they harbor it. And so when the the, the uh, farmer has trouble with uh, hoof and mouth disease they then go uh it, these guys go into hibernation and the and the farmer thinks everything's great and then they come out in spring and guess what the farmers have to deal with hoof and mouth disease again so you cannot import a european hedgehog unless it's to a very specific research or museum uh, natural history museum and and we can't have them here and they can't have them in europe in their homes unless they're rescuers now here i'm going to talk about mrs tiggywinkle a little bit because she kind of made things uh, hedgehogs popular in some ways they've been popular many years before but uh, beatrix potter wrote about mrs tiggywinkle and she Row, uh, and Mrs. Tiggywinkle is um, this little hedgehog here. She's a washerwoman and she, and she has a, a grand adventure and uh, with her friends. And uh, you'll know, perhaps know Beatrix Potter, Potter a little bit better by the book she wrote, uh, Peter, Peter Rabbit. I think pe more people are familiar. Um, now, and, and this is a, it was made by a friend of mine, Margaret Sather, um, for me, and I really, really appreciate it because it's so perfect. It's got Peter Rabbit in it. Um, and and uh, Mrs. Tiggywinkle is, is, has got a lot of these little dolls and, and things that people put together. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about rescues now. This rescue, this here logo is from um, Tiggywink Wildlife Hospital. So Mrs. Tiggywinkle actually has a wildlife hospital in, in Europe. 
and it is it has at least a thousand I mean, that's the least amount of wild animals it has that is rescuing and not just hedgehogs they do a lot of other work as well so they're they're a very big operation now the reason they need to get rescued in europe is different than why they get rescued here they get rescued in europe because um of habitat loss meaning places where hedgehogs like to live um, and so they no longer have a place to expand and find food. Um, for years, like us, they were uh, people in Europe were putting fences in their yard until they realized that hedgehogs, as their families grew, couldn't get through from one yard to another to find yet more food. And so they tried to cross the street and then became the next victim of Firestone tires because they roll up in a ball as we'll find shortly and they get injured or killed and need help. So if someone in Europe finds a hedgehog in the wild that's not well, um, or the other reason they might find them is in fall, a baby that hasn't gotten enough fat to hibernate safely, they take them to Tiggy Nichols Hospital or another rescue and they either bring them back to health and release them or the little ones that they keep that didn't have enough fat when it came time to hibernate, they keep them through the winter and then release them in spring. So they have a big job over there. And one of the, the reasons that they have such a big job is because the number of hedgehogs in British and Britain is decreasing a lot. And, and it's very much of a concern. It's, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's gone for something from something like 30 million hedgehogs to 10 million. So um, they, they're very careful about the hedgehogs. They're very well beloved in Europe. I'm gonna talk about my first hedgehog here before I talk about rescue. My very first hedgehog was Hoggy Goldbutt. He, um, as you can see, was an Olympic gold medal winner and he had it in uh, the art and the science, uh, the, uh, um, what is it? What, what is it? Art of <laughs> toilet paper tubing. He lived in that toilet paper tube. He'd put it on his head any time he could. So he'd shove his head into it, and the only time he took it off was when he wanted dinner. So he'd hit things, he'd shove things over, he'd look at you down it, he'd snore in it. And I just fell in love with him because he was such a character. He knew he was showing off for people, and he, he was really amazed when somebody didn't appreciate his skills. And from there, I realized that I really, really liked hedgehogs. And I got involved with a group of, of folks who are working with hedgehogs. And we realized the importance of getting hedgehogs if people purchased them and didn't realize um, that they weren't cats and dogs. And that often happens. Or, or there are there a number of other reasons we'll talk about why people give up hedgehogs? But um, I never, I never bought another one <laughs> because what we did. Now, Hedgehog Welfare Society existed prior to that very, very loosely. But what we did, a group of about five of us, is create um, a nonprofit animal welfare organization, Hedgehog Welfare Society. There were about five of us that did the work. It's a corporation in Oregon and uh, registered in my name. And that doesn't mean it's mine because there's a board of directors that makes decisions. Uh, we have, I think, about 1,500 member members worldwide. We have a Facebook page that you can look up. Um, and our, um, our purpose is to protect the well-being of pet hedgehogs through rescue, research, and education of people who care for them. So we often get questions about hedgehogs. And so we answer those questions. People give up hedgehogs for a variety of reasons. It could be because they've, uh, the most recent one, the woman was transferred to Europe. I had one that was was transferred to Pennsylvania, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, many come up because people have Sonic the Hedgehog. They see the movie, they buy one, and then they find out they're not cats or dogs or rats or mice, and they give them up. Uh, sometimes they're sick and they give them up. So we have rescued. Here, I'll show our rescues, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we are an entirely volunteer organization. There's none of us uh, get any money from this. In 2013, which is the first full year we currently have um, easily attainable, we had 110 relinquishments from people and 49 pla placements. 
In 2019, we had 447 relinquishments and 187 placements. That is a big jump in a few years. In 2020, we had 320 uh, relinquishments, 169 placements, or 159 with, with families, uh, new families, adoptives. Um, and so you can see the number of, the amount of work we do is going up. Um, they're getting, they're more popular all the time and more reasons uh, with a fluid society moving around that, we, that people have to give them up. And I wanna talk about this a little bit because you see all these purple states here. Um, Maryland is over here. Uh, it's, it's behind my stuff, uh, that my, the pictures that are showing up. So I'm not sure I'm hitting it quite right, but it's over in here. Um, you guys have two rescues that belong to us in Maryland. Um, but all of these purple states have rescues, either one, to, uh, the largest number I think I saw was four. Um, these gray states don't have any. And so if you have, have a hedgehog and need to relinquish it for any reason at all, we have to work a little bit harder to help you do that, to, to get them into a, a state that has a rescue. Now these orange ones are interesting because they are states in which hedgehogs are illegal. Hedgehogs in general cannot live anywhere in the United States because we, we always get too cold. And they can't get cold. They have to be somewhere in the 70s, uh, generally middle to high. And most places in the US with, with, a, with a one notable exception do get there sometimes. And that is over here in Hawaii. And there's very good reason for them not to be there because they could get out may not have any predators, may take over, cause uh, problems in the environment there. Alaska has uh, one or two. Now I've made, uh, well, Tex, um, New York's a different color because they aren't fully uh, illegal there. It depends on where you are. So you have to be careful what borough you're in. Uh, some boroughs on Long Island. This is California and I made them a different color because they really, they're illegal there like all exotics, but they really don't want to put hedgehogs uh, to sleep because well, it's anathema, right? It's something they don't want to have happen. So we have a representative there who works with humane societies and animal control to get the hedgehogs up here legal, either by plane or by, um, by ground. Uh, and there are ways you can do that. And so the humane societies will call us and the, um, the animal control will call us sometimes and we'll we'll get an authorized person to take them to the airport or to bring them up. So far this year, um, I've gotten, I got three in May here uh, by plane, five uh, about three weeks ago from Los Angeles. Um, the prior ones for San, from San Diego and then I got three two days ago uh, driven up from Los Angeles. So they're coming up Maybe COVID, maybe people are losing homes, maybe people, maybe the Sonic movie came out. I don't really know what the big increase is, but we are seeing quite a few in there. They all have homes. So nobody needs to worry about them. They got a good place to go. I'm gonna talk about a couple of rescues and, and, and I'm gonna talk about them first and then I'm gonna get a surprise uh, for you. This is Sammy the Talking Hedgehog. She was found in Kirkland, Washington um, which is kind of north, and underneath the car on the 4th of July. Now, she's a cranky little thing. I can't blame her. If I had somebody dumped me underneath the car, I'd be pretty cranky too. She hates baths, as you could see, because if looks could, looks could kill, I'd be dead. And she hates toenail clips, and she's got to have them. But the thing about her is she learned to communicate with me without words. And she, what she would do is either chirp or sneeze. And when I first heard her sneeze, I thought that she had a respiratory tract infection, but in fact, she was getting my attention. And the reason she wanted my attention is because she had a beach ball. And every night after that, and that night too, she put a beach ball in her water bowl. And her water bowl therefore was empty. And um, so of course I took it out and gave her more water in the morning. And, uh, and, and frequently she'd run out to tell me something, or if I didn't notice her, she was more likely to chirp. If uh, she'd be behind her little piglet, which is the home in which she lived, and she, she'd chirp at me to get my attention because she wanted to make sure I knew she was there. She didn't like me to pick her up. And I left her alone that way, except for baths and such. Now, <clears throat> Amy Rose was given to me by someone who 
was moving to Pennsylvania because their job went there. Amy Rose loved life upside down. And the reason she loved, loved life upside down is because her owner began to realize she had a problem. And he was afraid just either to take her to Pennsylvania where they're illegal and could be confiscated or to leave her with a friend who might not be willing to deal with what appeared to be a, a problem coming on, a health problem. And sure enough, uh, she, she had what was called wobbly hedgehog syndrome, which unfortunately is, is relatively common among hedgehogs, very much like multiple sclerosis in people or ALS. And these little guys, they deteriorate over time and they, they um, get so sometimes they can't eat. An interesting thing about her is she learned to pull herself up. So this, this material she's in there isn't, isn't sturdy enough to do that, but in her own cage, she grabbed something by her mouth, flip herself over, and go on about her business until she tipped over again. Um, unlike many hedgehogs with wobbly hedgehog syndrome, which can be as short as three months after you notice they have it, she lived two and a half years, and that's not what she died of. She was, she was just a, a little spitfire and kept going, and she was darling. Um, she became my good friend because ultimately she sat in my arm against my body, eating out of her bowl there. Now, at this point, I'm going to get a little surprise here. this little guy, uh, if you can see him, I got to get him up high enough, I guess. This is Kevin. <clears throat> Kevin came to me because his owner, uh, I'm afraid he's disappearing in and out, is he? Um, Kevin's owner, uh, I'll put him here, maybe you can see him there. No, nope. there he goes. Yeah, I think he's getting splinched. Uh, like Harry Potter's people. Anyway, he um, he's sweet. He's a very darling thing. He's about two years old, but his owner got, it went to university in Spain, and there's absolutely no way she can take him to Spain. Now, her owner, I mean, her the person she left him with had um, take, uh, taken, but she lost her home, and in losing her home, then she had no place to put little Kevin. So I have a little Kevin and I sort of fell in love with him because he's, he's quite the darling creature. Although here's what hedgehogs like. They like in and under. It's the safest place in the world to be. So if you have a hedgehog, it's not gonna, you can see him pushing his head around. Uh, it's, it's the safest place to be. Raptors can't get you, badgers can't get you, uh, whatever animals like to, to damage you. So, um, hey, Vicki, you might want to um, stop sharing your screen. So if you put the hedgehogs up to, to your screen, we'll see it bigger. Okay, let me figure out what I'm doing here. Stop share. There you go. And so now we can see the hedgehog pretty up. Okay. Far. There you oh, go. Here, here's where he, he belongs. There he is. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him something. I'm, I'm going to see if he'll do it. He just woke up, the poor little thing. They're nocturnal, so they're, they play... Uh, actually, they they play early evening and late morning, or I mean, late evening and early morning when it's when it, when it's really not very bright out anymore. But what I'm hoping is I can get him to stop being under and up. Yeah, there's his mealworm. He likes his mealworm, so now he's going to go somewhere here. So, all right, so he's my buddy. I'm gonna keep him here. I need to go back to the presentation. Um, and that's not the only surprise we'll have. So back to screen sharing. Let's see, share. There we are. Back, am I back? Yep, you're um, good. All right, so, hmm. oh, I'm missing something though, uh, because I can't get it to move forward. It won't go to the next screen. Why would that be? Um, is your presentation on full on like your full screen mode on your computer, like in a presentation mode? Well, I don't know now that we've done that how to get there. There you go. 
yeah, I, I can't do it through those things anymore, but now that I can do it, uh, however I can do it's fine. Um, we're gonna talk about the cultural attachments to hedgehogs because they're pretty phenomenal. And we've, we've already talked about Mrs. Tiggy Winkle written by Beatrix Potter. Uh, another one is a relatively new book called Hedgehog and Fog. It's from Russia and, and we'll look at that little hedgehog in a bit. Mecky dolls are famous in Germany. Uh, they have a lot of little, um, oh, short little guys that are um, sold in the stores there. And then there are lots of glass figurines and, and items in, coming out of Central Europe and other places as well. So over here on the left are some, um, some figurines and they're glass and, um, and people, artists make these uh, consistent with all of their, um, the, the fables and the stories that they love most. And so um, you can see back in the back, that little blue guy looks for all the world like um, Sonic, but each one represents for the, for various artists, what they see in the, hey, my goodness, he's, he may, he's licking me. So he may um, do something fun here in a minute. Um, over here on the right is Hedgehog in the Fog. And Hedgehog in the Fog is the little character in that book. Now this is handmade by a woman and she, she loves hedgehogs over there so much in that book that she made this little guy. Here's one that's actually commercial made by a company, another little hedgehog in the fog. Um, so there are lots of those out there as well. And here's the book on the right here. Uh, and he goes on grand adventures and meets lots of animals and has um, some terrors and scares. And of course, all is well in the end. But if you want to see this without buying the book, you can see it in um, YouTube. There are some really darling present, um, items in, in YouTube. Ah, here's one we know. Um, it's Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, of course, we all over here know about Sonic. And uh, he may be me the reason lots of people buy the hedgehogs because he's kind of a character. Now let's talk about some fun facts here. Um, for example, did you know that hedgehogs roll up in a ball? There you are. Um, this little guy is not rolled up completely. And the reason he isn't rolled up completely is because he's not scared. He just does that. They have a little round muscle, uh, goes around them like this, and it allows them to uh, curl up in a tight, tight ball. And, it, and when they're more relaxed, like this little guy, you can see the little hands and foot. And, and I think this is what people think is so cute. Uh, they can run seven miles a night. Here's Gromit, and Gromit is running like crazy. And uh, one of our um, charities, our, our fundraisers, is called the Wheelathon. And because they run so far, we have teams and people sign up for the teams to see whose hedgehog can make the most money. Um, and I don't know if Gromit was ever in, uh, Gromit isn't mine, he belongs to uh, Linda Woodring, uh, and, but he certainly did a lot of running and some of them just run like crazy. Others don't appreciate it quite so much, but they all do. They also anoint when they smell something new. Now anointing is a term we don't, usually think of in terms of um, hedgehogs, uh, but and it's something no other animal does. And when they smell or taste something different, they foam up so much that people in Europe used to think they had uh, rabies and kill them, but they'd spit it all over themselves, uh, whatever it, the smell was or the taste. And in fact, I had a little albino girl, remember the white ones, that he, that, um, had an, an infection, so she had some bubblegum flavored amoxicillin given to her by the vet, and as I gave it to her, she spit it all over herself. It was shocking pink, and she became shocking pink, and I had no idea how much amoxicillin stains because she, she was shocking pink for quite some time. I had to give her a number of baths. Um, they're born about the size of a walnut down here in the corner, uh, these guys um, are old enough that you can see their quills. In order to protect mama when they're born and, and when she's at the beginning taking care of them, they are born with little blisters kind of things, you know, sacks filled with water over their very sharp little quills. 
And within about an hour or two of when they're born, that starts to go away and you see the sharpest little quills. Like cats and dogs, their eyes are closed and they're, they don't have any hair. They're sort of funny looking, I call them frisbees. Um, but they, um, the mothers uh, parent them very much like any other animal. I've, I've watched parenting when, the, when some of the rescues came in and had babies and, and each one is different. They have timeouts, they, they have all sorts of things that they do. So I'm gonna get another little, another little person. This person is a relinquishment. Somebody gave this hedgehog up. I'm gonna put him away. And I'm back here and I, I'll start stop screen sharing in just a moment. Um, this actually is a rescue. Animal Control in California uh, raided a store that was selling all kinds of animals it wasn't supposed to. And all by herself, she was in the back in, um, in, a, in a glass container, no food, no water. She was very, very ill, very sick. And so they, they thought that she had wobbly hedgehog syndrome, but they brought her back to health and sent her up to me. I took her to my vet. She still had another she had an ear infection. He gave her medication for that, and now she's the wiggliest thing in town. And that's very common with hedgehogs that have gone through trauma. Uh, Hedgehog Welfare Society uh, collect, uh, were, given, were helped with a seizure of 600 hedgehogs in Texas, and many of them were kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, I just love her. She's adorable. And again, I'll stop screen sharing here in a minute. But I want to talk about these. These are babies three weeks old. And as you can see, they've already figured out how to anoint. Um, little, and this is a stinker, the black girl, I'm proud of it. And then her brother, her twin, Piglet. And um, they're licking my fingers. And so stinker is is anointing on herself at the time uh, and at the same time piglets over here licking my hands so they're really hey what are you doing big girl um they're uh they're very very uh unique and interesting babies are beautiful adults are wonderful if you've done your research and if there's somebody that you would want forever so let me see if i can stop sharing here for a second yeah, so I can get her a little closer and bigger. There she is. Now she's a, she's what I call the designer hedgehog. She's got different colors than usually they find in the wild. But she's awfully sweet. And I don't know how she is. I don't know how old half of them are that come in. But anyway, I want to thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I think that I need to hand it back. Thank you so much, Vicki, for taking the time to educate us on uh, all the ins and outs of hedgehogs and what hedgehogs are really like in real life. And uh, I did put the link to the rescue in the chat if anybody's interested in finding out more information. Um, if you really enjoyed this and you're really inspired by hedgehogs, make sure to visit the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts website and go to the Fall Fest. Um, link and uh, join in on our hedgy drawing contest. There's also a link for um, there's also a link for how to draw hedgy that Jan Brett will teach you how to do it step by step. I'm also going to open it up to questions. So if anybody wants to ask some questions right now, now's the time to do it in the chat bar. But definitely stop over at the museum while I'm waiting for questions. I'm just going to quickly. Um, tell you once again, in case you missed it in the beginning, uh, we have a hedgy drawing contest. The forms are here, you can get the bags. And if you can't make it in today, go ahead to our website um, and you can do that through the website as well. Um, also, in these little bags, you can get a couple little um, art making scratch boards and you can actually use your, um, some toothpicks just to scratch the picture of hedgy. And if you're so inspired by 
Jan Brett stories that you want to create your own creatures with your own their own personalities, you can also submit um, drawings of creatures that you've invented with their own little personalities. Uh, so please do so. We'd love to see them and share them. Uh, I see a couple questions here. Uh, Elizabeth is asking, are they sharp to the touch? They are, depending upon how upset they are. Uh, they have what's called an orbicularis muscle, which is the exact, I mean, I'm sorry, um, went out of my head. It's the muscle that, oh, erector pili, that has our hair stand on end when we get cold. Their muscle is a lot stronger, and so they can they can put their quills up. Now, she's comfortable in spite of the fact she's wiggly, and so I'm not having any trouble touching her because she's a little bit like a bristle brush. <laughs> but if they get upset and they roll into a ball, depending upon how old they are, they're pretty, pretty prickly. So sometimes those that always roll up, when I touch them, I, I pick them up with a fleece and then I remove the fleece when they're comfortable. But they, um, they can be pretty sharp. The babies are sharper than the old people, as one might expect. So yeah, they can be. Uh, another question, um, why don't we see hedgehogs in the forest locally? Because they don't live here. They never, um, uh, they've never been, they weren't part of it. Now, do you, maybe I, can I go back to the map? Or maybe I, there was a map at the beginning and I suspect uh, that someone missed that. These little hedgehogs that we have, there aren't any here. Um, nowhere in the Americas, Australia, Many, many of the islands, most of the islands, except uh, the British Isles, don't have hedgehogs. And I, I think the reason is because years ago there was a place called Pangaea that science, uh, scientists think that all of the continents were stuck together and started to drift apart. If you look, they sort of match each other and it kind of makes sense because things are always moving in the world. And it looks like they started moving apart before the 56 million years ago when the first hedgehog happened. Uh, into existence. And so those things that separated don't have hedgehogs. We don't have hedgehogs. They are just not here, not in South America either, and a lot of other places. And so the only ones we have are these little guys, and these little guys can't get cold or they'll die. And we're cold here for the most part. Um, and if, even if we're not cold all the time, we're cold sometimes. Even in Florida, they have cold snaps that would kill these little guys. Did that answer? Yes, I think that's wonderful. Okay. Uh, if, if there's any more questions, go ahead and ask them. Um, I am assuming that there probably isn't any more. Um, so I want to thank you again, Vicki and Jillian McMaster. Thank you so much. I didn't say your name in the beginning, but Jillian's the reason why everything runs so smoothly. <laughs> um, thank but you. thank you all so much. And this will be available for you to view if you miss something or you want to go back and review something that you heard. Um, or even get some inspiration for your drawings, uh, you can go back through this video and rewatch it or introduce it to someone else or use it educationally in your classroom if you're a teacher. So thank you all again. Vicki, thank you so much. This was so informative. I love them even more now. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty sweet. <laughs> well, everybody have a wonderful day. And we hope to see you here at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts to see Jan Brett's show uh, in person and see her illustrations and all those fine little details up close and see each individual little quill up close. <laughs>